How do you get on with, to have a good relationship, your parents? I think I get on with them very well, really. We don't always see eye to eye on some things, like boyfriends. They don't always approve of them. But on the whole, they're very understanding. If I had a personal problem, I think I could confide in them. And if I was ever in trouble, I know I could rely on them to help me. How strict are your parents? Well, my dad's quite strict about staying out late at night, but I can usually get around to persuade dad to allow her to stay out late. Him, if I'm nice to him, he lets me come home a bit later. My mom's always telling me to tidy up, arrange, my bedroom and put things away. It expresses to put something in the place or container where it is usually kept after I use them, and I have to do some of the housework, but if I compare them with other parents I know, they aren't very strict. And who are you most like in your family? Oh, I think I take after, similar to an older member of your family in appearance or character, my mother. Everybody says we're both very independent and strong-willed. I like to have my own way a lot of the time, but I'm not spoiled. I don't always get my own way and my parents always tell me off if I do anything wrong. How do you get on with your parents? I look up to, admired and respected, them because I know they worked hard to bring us up, to gradually become an adult, properly. How strict are your parents? They can be very strict at times. I told my dad I wanted a motorbike, but he said it was out of the question, too impracticable, impossible. It was too dangerous. My mother is strict about keeping things tidy. I can't get out of, avoid or escape a duty or responsibility. Doing the washing up, clean, and things like that, unless I'm very busy. How do you get on with your sister? I never agree with what she says, so we're always arguing. We've never been very close, but I get on all right with her. I think I'm much closer to my mother. What's it like being a parent? Bringing up children is very difficult. You always worry about them. You have to be very patient and put up with a lot like noise and even criticism, and you can't always get through to. Make them listen to you or understand them. Sometimes they just won't listen, but the advantages of being a parent outweighs the disadvantages. The main thing is to enjoy your children while they are young because they grow up so quickly nowadays. How strict are you with your children? I suppose I'm reasonably strict. They can't do what they like and get away with. Succeed in avoiding punishment, not punishment. It, and I tell them off, reprimand, speak angrily to someone when they do something wrong. And what is the secret of being a good parent? I think you have to give them confidence and let them know you love them. And you have to set a good example through your own behavior, otherwise they won't look up to you. And what do you want for your children in the future? I want them to be happy and I want them to look back on to think about something that happened in the past, their childhood as a very happy time in their lives. I'm having problems with my studies at school. I find it difficult to get down to work, meaning begin to do something in the evenings, and I can't concentrate on anything at the moment. I spend most of my time listening to records or watching TV instead of doing my homework. The other students in my class are much better than I am, and I have difficulty in keeping up with or remaining at the same level as them. I sometimes have problems following the lessons as well. I can't always take down or write the important things my teacher says because I write so slowly. She has told me I'm falling behind, meaning I'm getting worse and worse with my studies. I'm not good at writing essays, and I usually hand in or give in my homework late because I put it off or postpone doing it until the last minute. So I often have to invent 
silly excuses to explain why I haven't done the work. I'm sure I'm not going to get through or pass my final exams in June. I scraped through or succeeded in something, but with a lot of difficulty. The mock exams last February with the 54%. All the other students pass with flying colors. If you do something such as pass an exam with flying colors, you do it very successfully. I am now so far behind that I do not know how I'm going to catch up with or try to reach the same level as them. My teacher spent some time going through or checking my homework with me, but she found so many mistakes that I felt even more depressed. What do you suggest I do? I've done it. I've got a place of my own at last. I found it through an agency a couple of weeks ago. I was looking through, quickly read, the paper when I came across, fine by accident, an advertisement for flats. So I gave the agency a ring and went to see what they had. I saw several good flats, but I couldn't make up my mind, reach, make, or come to a decision about something, about them. Then I saw one I really liked. I was in two minds about taking it because the rent was rather high, but I thought it was time I became more independent of my parents, and I'm sure I was getting on their nerves. They said they couldn't put up with, tolerate, endure, to accept or continue to accept an unpleasant situation or experience or someone who behaves unpleasantly, the noise from my stereo system any longer. So I moved out, leave, and here I am in my own flat. It's in the suburbs on the outskirts of London, and it's very convenient for the shops. It's on the second floor and consists of a bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, and a bathroom. It's nothing out of the ordinary, but it's in quite good condition. I moved in last week and have already put up some shelves and new wallpaper in the living room. At present, the kitchen is painted dark brown and has a small window, so it needs brightening up. Means, make the room look brighter. I haven't finished doing up, decorating the bedroom yet. I'm going to convert it into a study and paint it blue so that it will go with the curtains my mother has promised to give me. There's a lovely view from the window. It looks out onto, see, the garden, which I share with four other people. I get on well with, to have a good relationship, the people living above me, but unfortunately I'm not on good terms with the landlord at the moment. We had an argument about sticking pictures on the wall. He said it would damage the wallpaper. And the people below me say they are fed up with, bored, annoyed, or disappointed, especially by something that they have experienced for too long, the noise from my stereo. The good thing is that I've got somewhere I can call my own. I can easily put you up anytime you're in London. So don't hesitate. You can drop in, visit, use to describe a place where people can go, usually to get help or advice at any time without making an appointment. Anytime. A blaze swept through a hotel in London yesterday, leaving damage estimated at 200,000 pounds. Some of the residents staying in the hotel at the time were able to escape via the roof onto adjoining premises. At present, it is not known how the fire started. It seems the fire broke out, suddenly starts. In the early hours of the morning, the fire alarm went off, start, at around 2 a.m., It is thought it was set off, start, by smoke coming from one of the bedrooms on the first floor. The fire spread quickly from the first floor to the second floor. The first brigade were called in, asked for the help, immediately, and firefighters were on the scene within 15 minutes, but by the time the hotel was already in flames. They fought the blaze and managed to get it under control, though it took them two hours to put the fire out, extinguish. Senior Fire Officer Mike Jones, who was in charge of the operation, said, It's a miracle no one was hurt. We had to break down several doors to rescue some of the residents from their rooms. Our people did a wonderful job. Two of them are suffering from smoke inhalation, but it doesn't look too serious at this moment. Mr. Lunnan, a resident, said, I never want to go through, experience something bad, an experience like that again. Everywhere was on fire. 
I'm just so relieved the firefighters succeeded in getting to us so quickly. Without their help, we wouldn't have got out, escaped. Another resident, Mr. Dale, said, I heard the alarm go off, and then people started screaming. It was very frightening. My wife and I had a narrow escape. We managed to get out of, a void, the building just in time. As we left the third floor, it burst into flames. We could hear people calling out, shouted, for help, but we couldn't do anything to help them. The hotel manager said, The fire probably started by accident. Perhaps someone was smoking in bed, forgot to put out their cigarette, and accidentally set fire to the bedcloths. Some people are very careless, and things can catch fire very easily. A policeman said, We will be looking into, investigating, try to discover, the causes of the fire. We think it started by accident, though at this stage, we don't want to rule anything out. Stop considering something as a possibility. Hello, Mr. Brown. And how are you? Well, I haven't been feeling very well recently. I get out of breath very easily when I climb stairs or walk short distances. And last week I started getting pains in my chest. Hmm, I see. Do you smoke? Yes, I get through about 30 cigarettes a day. That's rather a lot. Have you tried giving up? I have, Doctor, but I can't break the habit. Well, I think you should at least try to cut down on the amount you smoke. What about your eating habits? Have you put on any weight recently? Yes, I'm a little overweight at the moment. You see, I eat in cafes most of the time, and I tend to drive everywhere because of my job. I sell sports equipment. Well, it sounds as if you're out of condition. I think you need to take some regular exercise. What? You mean, take up jogging? Well, jogging or something like that. But the most important thing is, I think you need to lose some weight. So I want you to go on a diet. Oh, go on a diet? Yes, it's particularly important that you cut out fatty foods. What about alcohol? How much do you drink? About two or three pints of beer in the evenings. Hmm. I think you need to cut out drinking completely for the next few months. <laughs> well, that, that's easier said than done, Doctor. I agree. But if you don't change your lifestyle, you could be in trouble. Two. Hello, Teresa. And what seems to be the problem? Well, I'm not feeling very well at the moment. I'm preparing for exams, and I've been staying up late at night studying. This morning I got out of bed very early to do some more work, and I passed out. My flatmate found me on the floor. I came round after a few seconds. Hmm. Have you had any other symptoms? Well, I have been feeling a bit off colour, and sometimes I get splitting headaches. What do you think is wrong with me? Well, it sounds as if you've been burning the candle at both ends. You've probably been overdoing it, and you're overtired. I don't think it's anything to worry about, but I think you should take it easy for a while and try to get enough sleep. Yes. I haven't been getting much sleep lately. I'll give you something to help you relax in the evenings. And just try to have a few early nights. Thank you, Doctor. Three. Hello. It's Mrs. White, isn't it? That's right, Doctor. What can I do for you? Oh, dear. I'm always tired, Doctor. I'm absolutely worn out at the end of the day. Are you eating regular meals? Well, I don't really have time to eat. I'm too busy with the children. And we don't have much money for food because my husband's out of work. It sounds to me as if you're a bit run down. I'll write out a prescription for some extra iron and vitamins, and I'd like you to come back in a couple of weeks so I can see how you're getting on. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Four. Hello, Mr. Rose. How are you feeling? I feel a bit under the weather. I've got a headache and I ache all over. Hmm. You've probably picked something up. Let me see... 
Yes, you're running a temperature. I think you're going down with flu. How long will it take me to get over it? You see, I need to get back to work as soon as possible. About four or five days. I'll write out a prescription for some painkillers for you. I take these tablets three times a day, after meals. Meanwhile, my advice is to go to bed with a hot water bottle and drink lots of fluids. After a few days, you should feel as right as rain. It was love at first sight. Love at first sight is the experience of starting to be in love with someone as soon as you see them for the first time. I saw her standing on the other side of a crowded room, sipping a glass of wine. Our eyes met. I walked over to her and said, You seem to be on your own. Can I join you? She smiled and said yes. At first she came across, gives the impression, as rather shy. But as I got to know her better, I found out she was an open and confident person who was easy to get on with, to have a good relationship. At the end of the party, I said I would like to see her again and asked her out for a meal the following week. I took her out to a small Italian restaurant in Soho. After talking for a while, we found out, to discover a fact or piece of information, that we had a lot in common. In fact, we seemed to have the same interests and tastes in everything. She smiled at me when I spoke to her. And when our eyes met this time, I knew that I was head over heels in love with her. I thought that she was falling in love, to have strong feelings of liking a friend or person in your family, with me too. We started going out with each other. If you go out with someone, the two of you spend time together socially and have a romantic or sexual relationship. And after some time, we got engaged and decided to live together. We were both very happy and made plans to settle down and get married the following year. When someone settles down, they start living a quiet life in one place, especially when they get married or buy a house. However, it wasn't long before things started to go wrong. She seemed less affectionate and loving as the weeks passed, and I started to feel she was going off me. She criticized me all the time. Why are you always going on at me? I asked. In the end, I wondered if we were suited to one another. I was keen on hard rock, and she was fond of classical music. I was interested in sports, and she was interested in politics. We finally fell out over a TV program. To quarrel or disagree with someone about something, we had a terrible row, broke off our engagement, to stop doing something, and called off the wedding, to decide that something will not happen. A week later, she moved out, permanently to leave the house or flat where you live, or the place where you have your business. I was heartbroken, and it took me a long time to get over it to start to feel happy or well again after something bad has happened to you. A few months later, I heard she was engaged to a man who worked in local government. They got married, but after two years, their marriage broke up. If a relationship breaks up, it ends, and they got divorced. I tell you this because last night I went to a party and I was drowning my sorrows, to drink alcohol in order to forget your problems. When I saw her standing on the other side of the room sipping a glass of wine, I saw a man walk over to her and I heard him say, you seem to be on your own. Can I join you? Well, this is the flat. It's vacant at the moment. I'm afraid the previous owners didn't look after it very well, so it's not in perfect condition. Hmm. As you can see, it's in need of some decoration and repair. There are four rooms altogether. Kitchen, living room, bedroom and bathroom. This is the living room. It hasn't been decorated recently. Yes. It certainly needs doing up. All the wallpaper's coming off the walls. And it's very cold and damp. How is the flat heated? Well, there's an open fireplace. But it could be taken out and central heating could be put in. Hmm. It's not very large. I suppose I could put up some shelves for books and things. Do the carpets come with the flat? Yes, uh, though as you can see, they are rather old and don't add much value to the property. Yes, I agree. I think they all need throwing out, to be honest. What's that up there? Is that a hole in the ceiling? Oh, yes. I'm afraid it is. I didn't notice that the last time I was here. 
Well, that will definitely need seeing to before it does any damage to the property. Yes, of course. But I do think the flat has potential. It could look very good if it's done up nicely. Well, I'm certainly interested. Obviously, I'll need to talk it over with my husband. You say it's vacant. Does that mean we could move in immediately? Yes, the flat's empty, so you could move in when you're ready. Well, I'll certainly think it over. And if we decide to make an offer, I'll call you tomorrow. Thank you for showing me round the flat. No trouble, Mrs Jones. We hope to hear from you tomorrow, then. Goodbye. Goodbye. A. Aren't we going to run out of? There is none left. Petrol quite soon? I said. No, don't worry. There's plenty left, he said. Five minutes later, the car came to a standstill. We were out of petrol. Martin told me not to worry and said he was sure there was a petrol station somewhere nearby. He got out of the car and walked off. Walk in order to try and get rid of pain or an unpleasant feeling such as anger. Much to my surprise, he came back ten minutes later with a can full of petrol. He put the petrol in the tank, got in, and we drove off to leave in a car. I felt more relaxed now and thought that everything would be all right. Two miles later, the car broke down. If a machine or vehicle breaks down, it stops working. B. Martin switched on the windscreen wipers, but we couldn't see the road very well. A few minutes later, we couldn't make out to deal with the situation. Anything because the rain was so heavy. I warned him about the dangers of driving on wet roads, but instead of slowing down, he speeded up. He said it was getting late. Fortunately, we finally found the street where my interview was to take place. Martin turned to, start to do, me, and said, better late than never. As he said this, a car pulled out. If a vehicle pulls out, it starts moving onto a road. In from of us without warning. Martin managed to swerve just in time to avoid hitting it, but he ran into a parked car instead. The parked car was beyond repair. It was a complete write-off. A vehicle that is too damaged to be worth repairing. C. The following weekend, Martin picked me up at 8.30 a.m. He said his alarm clock hadn't gone off and that he had overslept. So we set off, start on a trip, later than we had planned. My mother was quite excited by the idea of my going to London for an interview, and she came to the front door to see us off, go to the place that someone is leaving from in order to say goodbye to them. Unfortunately, it was the rush hour, and we were held up, delayed, in a traffic jam for the next 30 minutes, but eventually the road was clear and we headed for the motorway. I noticed we were short of petrol and pointed this out to Martin. D. I didn't panic, but I could feel the nervous tension building up in my stomach, an increase, especially one that is gradual. Don't worry, he said. I know what's wrong with it. I'll fix it in no time at all. An hour later, he was still under the car trying to repair it, but without success. Then another car pulled up next to us, and the driver asked if we needed any help. He asked where we were heading for, and when we told him, he pointed out we were going in the wrong direction. He repaired the car, we thanked him for helping us, and we set off again. I don't know how it happened, but instead of arriving in London, we ended up to finally be in a particular place or situation in Manchester. E. The worst journey I have ever made was a time when I had to go to London for a job interview. I was living in York, in the north of England, at the time, and my car was under repair. I planned to go by train, but a friend called Martin said, No, don't go by train. You know how unreliable they are. They never run on time. I'm going to London next week, so I can give you a lift. I told him I had to be at the interview by 3 o'clock without fail. He assured me we would arrive in time. Don't worry, he said. We'll be there in no time. F. Martin got out of the car and told the other driver he was responsible for the accident. The other driver blamed Martin for what had happened. I left them arguing and went in for my interview. I apologized for being five minutes late, but they said it was all right because the interviewer hadn't arrived yet. When he came in, I recognized him.
It was the man who had pulled out in front of us. I didn't get the job. G. Martin told me not to worry. He said he knew a quick route to London from Manchester, but would reduce our journey time by half. This sounded too good to be true, but I tried to believe him. He said that if we drove fast, we could make up for lost time. To some extent, this was true, because he did drive faster, but unfortunately, a police car caught up with us and told us to pull over. If a vehicle pulls over, it moves to the side of the road and stops. To the side of the road. The policeman fined him for speeding, and we drove off. We continued our journey. We were near London when it started to rain.